and we are now recording. I want to welcome everybody to the Amherst Community Chat for Thursday, December 3rd. We have Dr. Mike Morris from the Amherst Regional Public Schools, um, Superintendent of the Amherst Regional Public Schools, joining both myself and your town manager, Paul Bachman. So welcome. Thank you for being here, Mike. Nice Thank tie. <laughs> Um, so we, we've got a, a lot of questions today that were pre-submitted and we hope for uh, folks in the room to be able to ask their questions live. They can do so by using the Q&A function as well as raising your hand from Zoom or star nine if you're calling from the phone. Uh, before we get to that, I wanna give a chance for uh, both, both your town manager and your superintendent to um, give a brief report out. You wanna start, Paul? Sure. So there are a couple things I want to mention. First is uh, we have top, a new program that started um, this week where we're partnered with the business community and local restaurants to provide uh, uh, dinner meals a couple times a week to people who have been pre-identified as being in need and, and suffering from food insecurity. And that's a really exciting program that's basically just through December. It's a limited time program. Um, we have partnered with the Family Outreach of Amherst to, who have already identified people who were um, work, who were need, needed and needed additional support in this area. The second thing I want to mention is that the Community Safety Working Group, which um, was the group that was put together to examine how we do community safety, specifically policing in the town of Amherst, has begun meeting. Uh, they've and um, you know, there are two former principals on it. Uh, Paul Wiley, who is former principal of Crocker Farm School, is the chair of the committee. And Russ Vernon Jones, former principal of Fort River School, is on the committee, along with five other really talented people. And uh, it's really an exciting committee. It's meeting every week, every Wednesday at 530. If anybody wants to uh, zoom in and, and, and listen to the meeting, it's a, it's a, I think it's a stellar group of people um, with a big agenda and limited time. So we'll see how they do. Great, thank you. And Mike? Sure, so I've got uh, a little lengthier list of um, updates. I'll try to keep it brief so we have more time for the Q&A for sure. But I uh, wanna start by um, just acknowledging that the state of the town is on Monday and Paul, and probably will remember the time better than me, although I know it's on my calendar. 6.30. 6.30, mm -hmm. thank you. And school committee chair, Allison McDonald will be presenting uh, a report about uh, from the schools as well as there's reports from other um, town departments and well as the town itself. So that's just an important one. And it's also just, a, it's a really nice event uh, in my opinion, where we get to see the different departments of the town. Um, you know, I think to the public, we each can be look pretty siloed. Uh, and the reality is Paul and I talk or text uh, routinely close to daily, I would say. Uh, in the same for Emma Dragon, the health director, you know, as she's come on, we're, we're in regular contact. Uh, and then the other departments as well. Uh, Tim Nelson sends me updates mm -hmm. about weather and, uh, you know, all these things. So we do function together and but we don't often, we're not often in the same, you know, literal or figurative place. Uh, and so just wanted to acknowledge that and really thank Ms. McDonald for uh, putting together, I think it'll be a comprehensive report. And, and I'll preview one thing, which, which I've said in other settings um, of late is, one of the major uh, focuses of the school committee and the community in the past few years has been diversifying our staff and faculty. And uh, this, about a week and a half ago, the state updated its, uploaded its um, website with the most recent data. And so five years ago, as compared to five years ago, we've seen close to a 50% increase in our faculty or BIPOC, um, you know, um, our staff of color. Uh, so, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're about 100 uh, five years ago, staff of color, and we're at 150 now between the Amherst and regional schools. So really good work done by Doreen Cunningham, our assistant superintendent, our principals, directors. It's been a very intentional focus. There's a lot of research and evidence of why it's important um, to be able to diverse, have a, a much more diverse faculty and staff and just want to, you know, share that. So it, it's, that'll be a prompt or a, a tease to see the rest of what Ms. McDonald is putting together as well as the other departments on Monday. Um, second thing I wanted to mention is just to thank the food service department. Uh, a couple, couple months ago, we went over 100,000 meals served uh, since the pandemic started. Um, and for those of you who don't know, you can find this information on our website or they have their own website, which I think is amherstfood.com. Uh, we have free meals for any, any child uh, ages five to 18 who resides in the town. Uh, we have over 10 sites uh, with specific time and it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And Monday you get a breakfast and lunch for two days. Wednesday you get a breakfast and lunch for two days. And on Friday you get breakfast and lunch for three days to cover the weekend. It's a great resource. It's completely free. It'll be free all year. I will say I'm a resident of Amherst. 
my children like it. I continue to pick up from there multiple times a week uh, and it's spread throughout town. So there, there's a site, no matter where you live in Amherst, there's a site pretty close to you. Uh, it's not, uh, the, one of the pieces of feedback we've been trying to sort of uh, correct is that some people think it's only for certain populations within Amherst. It's for any child ages five to 18 in Amherst. There's no, you don't have to bring a license. There's no, uh, you know, have to give your name, you pick up the meal. We just have to note it because of reimbursement from the federal government. It actually helps our district. The more meals are picked up because uh, we do get reimbursed for them uh, based on our existence in the summer meals program prior. So just want to thank our food service staff, and, but also really want to reinforce that it, the meals are there, they're good, and they're for anyone in the community. Um, third thing I want to mention is the school committee last week talked about, um, had a discussion about, or this week, excuse me, about athletics, winter athletics, and they'll, they'll come to some votes on next Tuesday. So if you have any thoughts uh, that agenda will be posted, I think, uh, like later today or certainly tomorrow morning, but um, they plan to vote on winter athletics next week. That's certainly high interest for many in the community, and so I wanted to communicate that. Uh, a couple of questions that both uh, Brianna got, but also that I've gotten by email and I tried to address on Tuesday night at school committee uh, relates to the, the uh, memorandum of agreement between the school committee and the uh, Amherst Pelham Te Educator Association, the teachers union here locally. Uh, and what I'll try to restate what I tried to say clearly on Tuesday, which was that um, my job is to implement both the policies of the school committee and then a, and legal contracts between you know, all of our bargaining units, not just the teachers union uh, and our school committee. And at this point, um, I, I know people have been asking me, why do I have to follow it? And I have to follow it because it's the law, right? So um, there's always, there are sometimes gray areas in contracts and, and that's what we try to work out with our bargaining units. And that's not just a local thing that happens everywhere that sometimes there's conflicts. Uh, the language is really clear in my opinion uh, on that particular front. And so I know that there's been a lot of families and community members who would like us to reopen schools sooner uh, and disregard the MOA. And that, that's not something that I feel like I can legally ethically do. Uh, based on what I know about the law and what I read in the contract. So I know that's frustrating for folks in the community, but I at least wanted, and that's not about blaming anyone, school committee, APA, and I said this Tuesday night, very, I tried to be very clear about it, but it is a reality that from a labor law perspective, um, I, I need to follow contracts that are signed. Um, so I wanted to clarify that. I want to thank our schools. We had really uh, what I thought were fabulous open houses. I was talking to Brianna about that a little bit earlier before we went live. Uh, the schools did live sessions with principals uh, or leaders and then uh, some videotape sessions with teachers to go over, you know, the different parts of the curriculum and, and how families could access them. And it was really well received. I think there were really clear guidelines. I want to thank in particular the high school uh, was our first open house and it went really well and all of our other schools followed their lead. But in a virtual environment, it allowed for, you know, ability to interact, but also an ability for uh, family members uh, who had their kids there at the same time, often uh, just because of the nature of, of things these days, to be able to, at their own pace, select the teachers that work with their children, find out about the curriculum, and really open the door to the parent conferences that were to follow. So uh, really well done. I just want to thank, thank our staff for doing that. We do have three distance learning centers uh, that are operating uh, in our schools. One is completely ours, and that's for a relatively small group of intensive needs students who without in-person support uh, don't have access to the curriculum. So we have 13 students right now that are being educated uh, virtually, but have in-person support at the high school, um, physically at the high school building. Uh, the second group is through LSSC, so or Amherst Recreation. Um, see if I got that right. I don't know if that name change has happened yet. Hopefully I'm not the faux pas. Brianna will edit it out if I'm ahead of, <laughs> ahead of where I need to be on that. Uh, who's operating in the building I'm in now at the middle school. And the last one is the Marks Meadow Aftercare Program. And again, they're providing uh, in-person support for students to access distance learning. Appreciate all of our partners on that. Um, one of the things that we continue to hear, experience, and read about is the, the very real concerns about mental health and well-being of students as we enter, uh, start entering the winter months and it's getting colder and snow in the forecast maybe on Saturday. And for some people, they rejoice for that. Other people are like me who wants to change my background to a really warm climate and pretend that I'm there. Um, and so we had an, one event a couple of weeks ago. We planned for two more with our Bright partners. Um, Bright's a, a program based in Brookline, but we, we partner with them. Uh, they're experts on mental health. Um, I thought the first, um, the, the two clinicians that led it, had tips that were not only helpful to me professionally, but frankly, personally too, uh, as we head into winter, how to support students um, and ourselves 
uh, for for uh, hopefully our, our only true COVID winter that we'll have. Hopefully the immunization and those pieces make things better in the future and we're not quite in this situation a year from now. And so we'll do another one. So be on the lookout for that, but we wanna provide tools and resources for families uh, in that realm. And the, I think that's it. Sorry, I took a little more time than I thought, but I wanted to, I haven't been on here in a while and I figured <laughs> I'd wanna uh, share some updates uh, with the town and the larger community uh, along those dimensions. And I'm happy for answer any other questions and, and dialogue that comes up. Great, thank you so much, Mike. And I think um, the in intro was great because it did address some of the, the questions that got sent into us previously. Um, so I, I hope the folks um, that sent in those questions and who are on the call, um, portions of your, your comments and questions were answered, but I will try to um, address the ones that haven't been um, as we take questions from the room and pre-submit it. So there's a couple questions that have come into the room. Um, we've got um, a comment and a question from a parent of a, a Wildwood student. One of the questions you an just answered, but um, dear Dr. Morris, thank you in the school district for your hard work in this difficult time. Um, I've got questions about in-person teaching. So what, cons what concerns the teachers about in-person teaching and what did the district do to ensure that teachers and staff are in fact protected? Thank you. Yeah, so we had a very robust plan. I think it was like a 38 page document that de delineated procedures um, that went well and above what the state recommended uh, in terms of safety. Uh, for instance, we bought, we have, uh, uh, five digits numbers of CAN95 masks, um, which was not necessarily a recommendation from the state. Theirs was more for more typical masks, um, but we purchased those. Uh, the state said we only had to have students masked if they were above a certain age level for us, unless they had a, a medical um, or disability related reason to not wear masks. We mandated everyone to wear masks. So, you know, we felt like we tried to provide the, the most safe environment that is possible. I think every environment in the COVID era carries some risk. Um, that's just the nature of it. And same, it's the same conversation we're having about athletics. Um, we had our, all of our rooms tested. There's no state requirement for ventilation. We said that uh, we would only have students and teachers in rooms that were above four air changes an hour, which is a standard that you know, kind of Harvard Public Health has set, but the state did not set it. Um, and to get there, we did invest a significant amount of resources into room purifiers with the UV light, which were recommended to us as the, the best in the market. So we tried to address concerns that existed. There, there is no way to address all risk uh, in, a, in the COVID environment. And I think that's, that's just simply the reality of it, um, particularly as we see rising numbers in our area. Um, you know, our distance learning centers are framed a little differently in that they're, they're accessing these learning students are away. They're not getting together in groups the same way you might in the school environment. Oh, the last one I should say that comes to mind in terms of safety is the state recommended a three to six foot distance um, and our school committee very quickly affirmed uh, my recommendation that we maintain a six foot distance between students and classrooms. So we did have students in for, um, you know, about a week and a half uh, in the month of October. Our, you know, feedback we received from directly from students and teachers was that it felt good that, that those requirements were being met for the most part. And then there are other individual students who had to build up mass tolerance. Absolutely, we're working on individual problem solving there. Um, so, um, you know, that, those are the steps we took and I want to, you know, also suggest that, you know, to assume a risk-free environment is not, is not, is not real in a COVID world. So there are some things that we cannot control. We recently got approved and got a state grant where we can have uh, symptomatic testing of all teachers and staff members and students. So we'll be implementing that in our distance learning center, the one we, we take ownership of at the high school. So anytime a student or staff member has any symptoms of COVID, and as you know, that the, the list is quite a long list, uh, we can have uh, testing right on site that would need to be confirmed later, but these are pretty high quality tests that um, can be done right away um, as opposed to waiting. And, and I think everyone's read the articles about some challenges with um, getting tested these days. So uh, we're, we have final pieces that we have to send to state will be sent out tomorrow. So we imagine we'll have that up and running before the end of the month. All right, great, thank you, Mike. We have a couple questions that have come in uh, live from the room. So I'm gonna take them in the order as they came in. Um, so here's a, a comment and a question. Comcast will be raising its charges for internet use so families may face higher bills while their children participate in distance learning. What will the school district do about this? Will they reimburse families? Right, so we've looked at that and we've looked at, and particularly for families who can't afford internet access, we have more than 100 mobile hotspots that we were supplying and really much of that is thanks to the 
PGOs who had a project last spring to raise funds for that. We've, we've exceeded the cost of those uh, at this point and we're covering those from the district, uh, which of course we're, we're, we're willing to do. Um, so I think that that is uh, what we've been able to do is try to provide internet access uh, for families who didn't have it. And that's been our primary focus. We've given out uh, well over, I don't have the exact number on me, I apologize, but you know, between K to 12 now, or pre-K to 12, I should say, uh, I believe the number is over 2,000 devices. You know, the very young level, you know, kindergarten, preschool, that's been iPads. At the rest of the lat, that's been Chromebooks to make sure that folks uh, had the technology they needed to access it. And as we did our distance learning, you know, survey, what we found is that very few people were maintaining, were having technology issues with distance learning. And, and our focus has shifted much more to the pedagogical challenges uh, that come from um, that mode of learning. Uh, and we're taking, we're, trying to look at that and see how we can improve things as best we can best we can for the student experience. Thank you. And I can say just to having a, a third grader who is remote learning right now in the in the district, she now uh, thinks she's in IT and knows more about me for troubleshooting stuff. So thanks for that. Um, all right, so we got a bunch of more uh, comments and questions. So I'm just gonna go right through them. Um, I'm a parent of a Wildwood second grader and who is considering other options for my son in the spring, given, given that it's currently seems unlikely that children will return into in-person schooling this year because of the MOA with the APEA. Um, is there anything parents can do to help with the situation with the APEA MOA who want to stay in the district, but also see that our children are falling behind? Yeah, I think uh, people have, and I think continuing to communicate with the elected officials, the school committee, you know, I get CC'd on all those. I read every email I receive, um, but as they're the bargaining agent or one, one of the two bargaining agents, that's where I would uh, continue to communicate with, um, you know, they have reached out to the APA to see if they were willing to renegotiate. That process has not been agreed to uh, at this moment, but I think continuing the communication and sharing those experiences. I know every school committee member reads every email they get and takes that very seriously. And um, that would be my recommendation. Uh, and you certainly can CC me, but anything that goes to the email address is school committee at arps.org, school committee, one word, uh, at arps.org. And, and all of those get forwarded to me as well. So I do have access to those. And, um, I, you know, that would be, um, I think, the, the best vehicle by which uh, to communicate their concerns. So, so you can't just wave a magic wand and say, hey, everybody come back to school Monday, right? I can't, you know, we have a contract that we need to implement and that's the way contracts work. Um, and I think, you know, as we look to work with partners around distance learning, we've been trying to try to meet some needs, um, some of the intensive student needs, some students who are struggling with attendance. Um, and I know that working with those programs, they are looking to potentially expand uh, when we get into January to open up more seats. It's not quite the same thing. Uh, I want to be clear as, as opening school, uh, but for some families, um, I know that's made a huge difference for them. Um, and I was up there yesterday, really well run, kids enjoying it. They're, they're around other kids, even if they're in different classes, they've got the headphones, but it's been a really successful model uh, for some students. And then I think a lot of people are also asking, so if it's a school committee in the, in the union and it's the two of them have to both agree to come to the table to change what the, what's what's been agreed to so until both parties say yes i will sit down at the table you know people are saying well what when can this change and it's until they both parties agree to sit at the table and that's why you say contact your school committee members because they are the elected officials who are at one of the two parties at the table yeah thank you for clarifying that that was yeah. really helpful paul appreciate mm -hmm. it and we do have a couple of the questions in the room that kind of relate and connect back to that that contract question, such as, you know, does, is it is the particular iteration expire at any given mm. point? And, um, and and then another question asking if if they don't agree, when's the next opportunity to revise these criteria based off of a time frame? Mm. Yeah. So uh, I'm just going to make sure I get the language correct, but um, the MOA is for this current school year. Um, yeah, the title of it is regarding the 2020-2021 school year. Um, so, you know, if nothing changes in terms of renegotiating, um, the MOA was written for the, you know, the school year that ends in the end of June. Great. All right. So we still have a lot of questions in the room. So I'm going to try to um, run through those now. So we have uh, mental health is not only counseling. Mental health could be helped in the winter snow if outdoor programs were offered for kids and teens to skate, sled, hike, build a fire together, et cetera. What can the town and schools do about it? Thank you. I'll start with that one. So we actually had a conversation with the um, 
the LSSCs now are the recreation department uh, based on, and so that's that's exciting. And the, you know, that the recreation LSSC is looking at lots of different options, including, you know, we've had a request for multiple skating rinks. We've done, we've created skating rinks in the past to talk with the health director. She thinks outdoor skating is good if you're doing things outdoors, much better than anything indoors. Um, you know, looking at, you know, activating Cherry Hill as a more as, a, as an opportunity for cross country skiing. You know, I think, you know, the LSSC, I, I still say LSSC, I have to train myself. Um, and, you know, I know we have the chair of the LSSC commission in here. Um, you know, they are actively thinking along these lines. To, and I agree with you 100% that, you know, mental health of the next three months plus is going to be really challenging for everybody. We've talked about it for our town staff as well this morning because um, it's going to be a hard time and especially if the caseloads keep going up. And so, and being having children, especially outside activated. And uh, I know that they've worked closely, the LSSC has worked closely with the school district um, to utilize the Pelham gym uh, for basketball. And so that's, re that's really exciting because that has a really good airflow exchange. Um, a lot of our buildings don't have that that quality of airflow exchange. So we're going to be um, utilizing that space for basketball programming um, multiple nights a week, I think. Yeah, that's what exactly. I'll, I'll piggyback on, on that one, Paul, and I'll get on Barb's good side by saying Amherst Recreation is working effectively with us. <laughs> um, so one of my jobs is I'm also the superintendent of the Pelham School. It's a different district. Um, and, and as Paul noted, their, the ventilation scores in their gym were um, very, very high. Gyms generally aren't very good, as you may have read in the newspaper. And I'm not just talking about our gyms, but gyms in general uh, do not have good ventilation. Pelham's for a whole host of interesting reasons I won't get into on a, uh, here has uh, particularly good ventilation. And so we do have, uh, we have allowed an outside soccer group that was for an all comers um, to do a session uh, there in Amherst Recreation is looking and sent us a schedule to start up, uh, I believe, right after the new year, uh, of basketball clinics for students, I think as young as third grade and then as old as eighth grade. Uh, as I mentioned, the school committee will be considering um, winter sports uh, and voting on that next Tuesday. And, you know, I agree with the health director, I agree with the comment as well, that it is going to be a challenge this winter. As Paul noted, you know, case counts are continuing to rise. Uh, and being outside is ideal. Uh, and so we do have one indoor space that, you know, um, according to health directors, both not just the current one, but past ones, it's meeting the threshold uh, for some indoor activity. I think it'll be booked uh, very much throughout the week from interested vendors, because this is a rare resource, uh, not just in Amherst and Pelham, but in the area more generally. And I think, you know, continuing to have ideas uh, for us to think about both at the town side and the school side, you know, would be great. Please send them our way of, of other things that would interest uh, children in ways to safely get together over the winter. Um, please, you can send them to me, you can send them to Paul, I'm sure he doesn't mind getting them, or to send them to, you know, our bills at Amherst Recreation. I think the, the more ideas we have, the better programming will be. And in, in the uh, Amherst Recreation brochure, um, which includes um, everything that we just talked about, plus a couple more activities will be coming out in the next couple of days. Um, and Amherst Recreation is it's transitioning away from LSSC. Um, so they'll be, um, we'll be putting out, uh, you know, a new web address and a new um, email address to, to fall in line with that. So that's some exciting stuff that's coming up for Amherst Recreation. All right, so I'm gonna go back to the questions in the room. Um, how much money have the town and region spent to enhance safety in the schools that now stand effectively empty? So most of the funds that have been spent have been CARES Act funds, both the town, which has been generous to share those with the school, as well as our school specific ones. But, you know, I don't have a, a specific number off the top of my head, but it would be multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars. Just the work at Wildwood and Fort River um, would be combined over $200,000 in terms of closing quads and making classrooms that used to, or spaces that used to have four classrooms too, but full walls and changing the ventilation. Um, so I, I can give a specific number, but I can certainly say it would be a six digit number. Great. Um, can't the schools offer extra co curricular activities for teachers who are willing to work in person? Would that be against a contract since it would be extra? No, and that's happened. So at our high school, we had um, the drama teacher did a dramatic performance, actually multiple dramatic performances uh, with students outside in the fall. Uh, they were really cool. I'm sorry if you didn't miss them. This newspaper did a nice job covering them. Uh, sports is another example of an extracurricular uh, that's occurring um, outside the school. So there's nothing barring uh, that from happening um, at all from the MOA. 
Okay, another question and comment. ARPS is now one of the few towns in, in the county that has remained closed. Is this information being communicated with the teachers? In my experience, some seem surprised that the public schools are teaching in person. Yeah, so I, I don't know. Uh, I don't uh, control the information flow of what goes to all staff members. Uh, I do think it's been widely reported. I think you can't look at the Gazette and not see an article about schools somewhere and what they're doing. Um, but uh, I do think it's been you know, communicated in, in a broader sense that uh, at this point we are, uh, in terms of Hampshire and Franklin County, uh, one of the few school districts that is not uh, open at least um, to some level of in-person learning. All right, I've got a couple more here in the Q&A that were um, from the room. So I understand the ethical obligations to uphold a contract, uh, what about the ethical obligation to provide free public education to our children? Um, this person feels that right now that second obligation is not being upheld. Yeah, no, I, I, and I understand that. And we've heard that from many family members. Um, at the same time, you know, my perspective is that I can't uh, knowingly um, break a contract um, that's been signed in good faith uh, by both parties. So I, I hear that and I understand that. Uh, and again, I think, you know, the more people can communicate their concerns about that to the critical stakeholders, and I'm one of them, is a good thing. All right. So the last um, live comment that I have here, um, so feel free, folks, as we wrap up on our half hour, um, is your last chance to, to pop a question in the Q&A and to and or raise your hand via Zoom. Uh, for those of you who did submit questions, if they weren't fully addressed, um, I did copy the superintendent on those. So he has um, your full comments and questions there. Um, so with all that happened with the APEA and school negotiations this year, we're hoping that everyone has learned from those mistakes and listened to parents about what we need for next year, about what we need for next year. Are plans being made to address that? Yeah, that's actually, uh, it's a great question. And there was some dialogue about this on uh, the school committee meeting on Tuesday, and it'll be on the agenda for the next school committee meeting, which is on the 8th next Tuesday, is thinking ahead towards the 2021-2022 school year and a whole variety of issues, not just about the MOA. So I think um, I can't speak explicitly for the school committee, but based on what I heard on Tuesday night and what I imagine will be some dialogue next Tuesday, um, I think they're, they're actively are thinking as soon as possible of clarifying what the program will be um, for next school year and to take into account lots of the feedback, not just from staff members and parents, but the larger community as well of what we want to think about for the next school year. So I think that comment's spot on and that's why the school committee is starting these conversations significantly earlier than they typically would. Great. Okay. So we're, we're almost at our, our half hour. Um, I want to give the chance for, for Mike and or Paul to, you know, leave the room with, um, leave people in the room with something that you didn't get asked or didn't get brought up yet. I'll defer to Paul as I typically do to go first. <laughs> no, I think just the, the number of people who are participating in the questions, it, we, we know that this is a, a driving issue in the town right now. I know uh, the, the school committee and the, and the superintendent are struggling with this and hearing everybody's voices. Um, it's a tough one. Uh, and so I just feel for, for the, my colleagues on the school side for that. Um, so I don't really have a lot to add. I, yeah. I did have one last question that came into the room um, that I'd love to make sure it gets asked if that's okay, if we go over Please. a minute. Yeah. Um, so what is the school district doing about the high number of absences among students, particularly low income minority students who are already underserved? Yeah, so um, we had uh, about an eight point plan that was presented the last uh, maybe two school committee meetings ago uh, about how to approach the absence issue. The short story, if you, those of you who weren't watching or the, the number of absences or attendance is roughly similar to, to last fall when we were in person, but the distribution was troubling to us. Uh, it showed that students who are typically underserved in school, so our BIPOC students, uh, our low income students, um, special ed students actually attendance was better. Um, uh, that, that actually showed minor, probably not statistically significant improvement, but, but those other groups were, were highly concerning. Um, so uh, every principal in their goals for me this year has delineated their plan. Uh, it involves you know, some working with distance learning centers, but uh, that's gotten maybe more attention than some of the other parts. Um, every school now has an attendance uh, team that's regularly tracking attendance, making phone calls. People have been assigned different roles and responsibilities. Uh, to make the one-on-one -on -one connections, to understand what are barriers that are going on. 
uh, the, the feedback we're getting is technology is actually pretty low on the list of the barriers. Um, the barriers are, are more often uh, kind of individualized concerns about access to the curriculum based on um, language, linguistic, um, staying engaged has been a major challenge uh, as probably but everyone like on this call experiences uh, being on screens <laughs> a lot is, is a challenge and, and we're all adults um, and uh, that can be a challenge for students. So we are trying to address the root of the problem and what we find is there's no one root of the problem. Um, but the but Mike, yep, Mike is, is, if someone does know someone who, who does have a technological barrier, can they reach out to the school district to help if they say I don't have, they don't have a computer at home or whatever, they right. can reach out to the district and get accommodated? Absolutely. And we're finding that out. So as these individual reach outs happen, there are very small numbers of people who are indicating that that's the barrier. It just doesn't seem to be the predominant one, but absolutely. And that's why when we're noticing absences uh, accumulating, we typically had an email that went out and, and a kind of set of steps and we're accelerating that. So we're trying to be ahead of patterns that we would that would be concerning to us. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of getting email, we're getting folks are getting direct phone calls and having direct communication to try to understand what are the barriers. Um, so it, it's a good point, Paul. I should have said that. Absolutely. If anyone has a has a technology challenge, please let us know. Um, what we found so far is that hasn't been the predominant challenge. Mm -hmm. That has uh, that folks have expressed uh, about being on uh, being in virtual school. Sure, sure. Yeah, but thank you, Paul. That was an important point, and and we've got, you know, it was an international Chromebook shortage in the fall. Um, some of that was because of the pandemic, but actually a lot of that was based on labor violations on the other side of the world that um, meant that a, thousands and thousands of Chromebooks were confiscated, depending on who made a specific part to them. So. Uh, you know, we, we did well. Our IS director found other resources and other ways to get them, but now all of our backordered ones have come in. So we're not short on ability to have technology. Great. That's um, good to know. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it, I think the challenge of distance learning uh, for many families who are struggling, um, you know, we've resolved the tech part and it, it's the, the engagement, uh, the learning part and, and making sure that students and families are receiving feedback routinely. And that's been more the theme that we've heard um, mm -hmm. of late. And so, you know, we have a pretty strong approach. Our principals are taking this very seriously. Uh, again, it's in every single one of their professional goals for the year to improve not just the overall attendance, but the distribution, because we, we know it's a problem. Uh, and we're trying to work collaboratively with families on how to solve that. Great. And I think we're going to ask something I didn't share. So that's a good one. Um, <laughs> so I want to note uh, two things. Uh, one is that we have an extended December break. The school committee uh, had a great discussion about this in the summer. And uh, our winter, our last day of school before the winter break is actually December 18th, that Friday. So I just want to note that. And some of that was, uh, well, you know, we're not encouraging people to travel. We follow CDC guidance. We know that the reality is um, some people, um, when this decision was made, the world was in better place with COVID, or at least our world was in a better place with COVID. Um, but we wanted to have an extended break because we, we just thought it was in the best interest of everyone uh, to have a, a longer break of school. And I think that's proven to be a, a good idea. So uh, we have a, a full two week uh, vacation period, starts on the 18th and students will come back on Monday, January 4th. And, and I think the second thing I want to note is I just want to thank, you know, this is obviously a contentious issue in just about every community. Um, you, you, any paper you look at is dominated with stories about this. And, um, you know, there's a quote I said, sort of like, um, it, Shmuel Rosner wrote it, it was a couple of weeks ago, um, fewer, fewer things prompt hatred, fear, and vengefulness like a pandemic, right? And I think there's some truth in that. And I just want to thank the community while there's been strong opinions shared in today and in other days, uh, I think we've done, in my opinion, pretty well at having those opinions shared and not getting to a place uh, where our community uh, is, is truly splintered like it's happening. I'm not pretending that these aren't, these aren't hard conversations, that people don't feel really strongly on one side or another or some third way. Uh, but I also just really appreciate the questions today, the questions Brianna sent me, and they're being framed in a problem-solving approach. I can't promise we'll solve all the problems, but what I can promise is we read every single comment. Uh, and I appreciate that, that people are uh, very often going to the place of how do we resolve this? How do we improve this? How can this change? Uh, and not to a different place where frankly, many superintendents and school committees and other folks are experiencing uh, very personal attacks against teachers, against 
parents, against school community members. You know, my job is just the nature of it. I'll get the attacks and that's fine. So I'll leave myself out of that for the moment. Uh, but, you know, I, I, given the intensity of the issue, I just really want to thank how people are framing their concerns, their, their legitimate uh, concerns for their children, their very legitimate concerns for their children's future and the learning, um, teachers' very legitimate concerns about health. Um, so I know it's contentious. I know it's really hard. And yet I just, I hope we can maintain the sense that we can advocate without becoming, you know, adversaries. And uh, that's sort of the approach that I'm trying to take throughout all of this is that I hear everyone's concerns. I have certain opinions. Uh, I think it comes as no surprise to someone that, you know, I wish kids were in school more often, right? I've said that since we started talking about this in June. Uh, there's no surprise there. That's not a controversial statement. That's, you can go back, watch school community meetings, talk about some challenges of distance learning and some of this, all this, what's happening. Uh, you know, I, I've spoken about, we have, we have an MOA that we have. The school committee is requested to sit at the table. They can't do things uh, unilaterally. Uh, and, and it's a very frustrating place for many members of the community. So I want to both acknowledge that, but also share an appreciation for the framing and, and how people are expressing some very deep-seated, uh, very deep-rooted concerns about their children and what they're experiencing. Uh, so I just really want to thank everyone for coming on this chat. Thank everyone for the emails that you're getting, uh, that you're sending. Uh, they're all being read. They're all being appreciated uh, by everyone who sees them. So thank you all. Great, and thank you, uh, Dr. Morris, for joining us today. This will be, um, this is being recorded. We'll put up on our playlist, and next week we will be having our uh, public works superintendent to talk about public works updates and winter prep and, and all things um, infrastructure, et cetera. So tune in next week as well, and I want to thank everyone who joined us today. Thank you. Have a nice day.